Sawground. Thank you for joining us. Let's worship together. It's really here. dark with all these like Edison bulbs. <laughs> Hi, I'm Josh. I'm Leah, and this is Levi. Hi, I'm Bob. And I'm Bernice. <laughs> I'm Drew. And I'm Kim. And we're, we're the, the Jensen's. Jensen's. We got married 30 years ago. Um, yeah. We have been married for 23 years. Mm -hmm. My favorite thing about Christmas. Um, 
at least growing up and now was just like the magic and the mystique of waking up and just not knowing what was going to be underneath the tree and um, we would get so excited at my house growing up and we'd like run out and see if Santa came and I'm like just a I'm a kid who gets nervous for everything and I'd even be nervous to go out and open my presents on Christmas morning so I just love the magic that surrounds Christmas. I have a granddaughter who's 24 with two kids and we used to and when she was growing up it was her and I used to make Christmas cookies. My daughter and I typically take one day of Christmas vacation and make a few cookies. Um, there's always a Toll House cookie which isn't very Christmassy but nonetheless it's still a favorite and that's probably it. Which is your favorite? They're all my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> you got so much you want to get done and you don't want to mess any of it up. And I'm not a person that goes in, I think I'll try three new kinds this year. No, no. I know how to make chocolate chips, spritz, sugar, Russian tea cakes, which tends to be, it's like a little ball of sugar and butter. Covered with sugar. Covered with sugar. <laughs> and it's delicious. And everybody in our family loves them. And they're hard. Cookie baking to me is, it's, um, oh. you have to follow the recipe. You can't get creative. This is miscreative. Give like me the recipe, I'll follow it. There'll be good cookies, no problem. Yeah. Um, my favorite thing about Christmas, I think, is decorating the tree every year and like going back through and all the memories with the different ornaments and stuff, like remembering Christmases before through that tradition. Every, every single Christmas we get a different Hallmark ornament that like represents something from our life growing up or something that we were into this year. Like when I was little I had a Cozy Coop car, the little red and yellow car, and um, when I like turned 20 my mom got me a Cozy Coop um, Hallmark ornament just like as a throwback to when I was a little kid. We started a long time ago just making a brunch on Sunday morning, on Christmas morning and um, looking around to see who had family in the area or who was alone. And we just invited people over. Sometimes on Christmas Eve, the kids will ask, hey, who's gonna be here tomorrow? And, and sometimes we'll answer, we're really not even sure. But whoever shows up is, is who's there and it's always a special time. Essentially coming back home meant spending um, the time that we weren't actively involved with family, we spent the time with his brother's family and they were younger kids and they had two dogs and three kids. And we decided that if we ever, uh, if there was such a thing as reincarnation, we wanted to come back as their dogs. <laughs> well, since this is first Christmas, we're all gonna wear matching pajamas uh, as a family. Um, we have matching pajamas for me, Leah, Levi, and even our dog, Carson. So um, now that we're like a little family, I guess that's something we're gonna start doing every single year. Um, it's not by choice, my mom bought us the pajamas. Um, so we're gonna wear them, and then if she keeps buying them, we'll keep wearing new ones every single year, I guess.
One of the cool things that we got to do when they were growing up is our church was really big on, on serving meals and serving those who, who were in need. And literally we would do hundreds of meals. We would go deliver. And the kids got to be a big part of that and, and uh, just helping them to to want to serve and, and you know take care of other people. We, we would get together on a Saturday morning and we would go to the food lion where we lived and we would literally pick up all these boxes that were prepared ahead of time and turkeys and hams and and we would come back to the church and we'd organize it all and then we would literally split it up and go. We would go to places to uh, nursing homes. We went to the cancer center where we lived and uh, we would we would go and pray with people and, and serve them food and talk to them and and really just share share Christ with people. It was it was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. and, and all the kids got to do that with us. That was a, something we did together. For me, I mean, I'm home, I'm home alone with him a lot. And so like I read to I've started reading books to him a lot. And my mom gave me um, all my old Christmas books. And so like, going back through and seeing like they were gifted to me and then reading, reading like the the Jesus's birth story to him through like that simple language has been really cool like to revisit it you know that's something different that I wouldn't have had if we didn't have him. Now that they're older and the reality of them moving on moving out um, is sort of in very very front and center in our lives and so we're thrilled that this year they are home and we'll just cherish that time that we get, for sure. Christmas ends up being more the two of you. Because see, along that way, the parents die. I mean, they got old enough. I mean, it's not like they died young. They just, they aged out and they died. So now you don't have your parents. In my family, the fragmentation is much bigger because um, I have two brothers who are Jehovah's Witnesses. So they and their families don't really celebrate Christmas. That's pretty sad. Um, but the units that did come together again, we've all eight gotten older and our children and families have gotten bigger. And so it's harder to get together. And the glue, which was in my case, my, my mom, now she's no longer there. And so it's, you're, you're not, um, you're not as, as intense about coming together and being with mom and the family. Not being able to get together has been really hard on me. Um, I didn't realize how much of my personality and who I am like involves being around people and just seeing people and talking to people and feeling trapped um, like gives me this sense of like anxiety. Yeah, when you talk, when you asked about like being home for Christmas, my mind went to like church at Christmas too because I feel like that's part of it. It's having that every year. So it's been hard like not being together even throughout this season, but in general, and now he's born and nobody's met him. <laughs> well, you just can't get together with your, with, the, uh, with your family. It's not so much different for us when you're dealing with your children, your adult children, who are- They're working, I mean, they have they, their they own have, children. They have their own children, they have their own lives, they have- Sports. It's, yeah, it's just every, but that's okay. I mean, that's the way it's supposed to be. Uh, it typically involves going to church, celebrating typically involves church, uh, Christmas Eve. Uh, we do a devotion when we have everyone over for the brunch. Uh, we'll do a devotion at the beginning of that and then pray before we eat and, and enjoy that. Um, but having Jesus as the center of all that's important to us. And not to sound cliche, but really the, the one thing it, that would make it not Christmas is not celebrating what God's done for us in Christ. That's the bottom line. That's the end of the day for us. It's Jesus.
Hey everybody, it's Solid Ground. Uh, this is Dave Fry. I'm the lead singer of the band Sidewalk Prophets. Wanting to wish you the very merriest Christmas ever. Feels like this year's lasted four years, and so Christmas is coming, and we need to celebrate mightily. I wanted to, first of all, wish you Merry Christmas, and second of all, let you know a little bit about our song Prodigal. Um, when we wrote it, it was because we knew we needed to write it. The number one prayer request we heard time and time again while we were on the road was, hey, pray for my son, my daughter, pray for my mom and dad, pray for my friend. They've left the church, they've gone away, and I don't know how to get them back. And so it feels helpless sometimes. You wanna go and just grab them back and you know, get them back no, no matter what, no matter how. But we know that God's timing is perfect, that even when folks are lost, that his eye is on the sparrow, that he leaves the 99 to go find the one lost and that our God is in control. So we sat down with that in mind, realizing that the same feet that, that took us away from God can turn around and let us run to him. That's what happened. The father saw his son in the distance and he didn't wait. He ran to him, threw his arms around him, kissed him and said, my son is home. And I'm telling you, no matter where you're at on your journey, God is close, God is near. He loves you in a mighty, mighty way. In fact, he sent his only son to prove that. Born in a manger, dying on a cross, resurrected, and once again, giving us life and a light this holiday season. So Merry Christmas. May your journeys be incredible. If there's anybody you know that's lost, we will make sure to send a prayer up for them as well. But we love you. We hope that you have an awesome holiday season. Merry Christmas to all and a happy new year. Since you felt peace In the valley you made Where you're not meant to be Where the shame throws Shadows on you But don't you forget That you're headed to more But you settle for less Don't buy the lie It's as good as it gets The same feet that left you Lost and alone Are the very same feet That'll bring you back home Where
<laughs> well, Merry Christmas, everybody. And, and can we just acknowledge before we go any further that this is not like any Christmas any of us have ever experienced. Like I was thinking about it this week that basically this year's Christmas is like the lull or like biggest conflict moment of, of every Christmas movie you've ever seen. You know what I'm talking about? Like, like normally the thing about like Rudolph, there's always that moment where like, you know, Santa, he, he wants to go out and, and, it, and the, the storm is too big. And so Santa's like, all right, you know, if something doesn't change, Christmas is going to be canceled this year, right? Or I think they said the same thing like in Ernest, like, you know, if Ernest doesn't save Christmas, it'll be canceled. Or like, with the Grinch, like, oh man, like, Christmas is going to go away. Did any of us actually think that in our lifetime, that would be a possibility that somehow Christmas could actually be canceled? And before you email me and go hyper spiritual with this, like, well, you can't ever take away Christmas. Actually, you can. The the word Christmas comes from Christ Mass. It's talking about a specific religious service where we honor the, the, the entrance of Jesus into creation. So yes, Christmas absolutely could be canceled, but we're so thankful that it isn't. And man, I'm just going to tell you right now, in the middle of all this COVID insanity, I, I want to just begin our time by, by maybe just finding some common ground. And maybe this is where you are as well. I am over all of this. What about you? Like, I'm just, I'm, I'm over it. I'm over the COVID. I'm over the Rona. I'm over like all the stuff that, that goes with life in a pandemic now to say nothing of all the horrible things with, with the sickness and the death. I mean, just basic day-to-day -day life. I'm so tired of it. I'm tired of wearing a mask. I'm tired of now, because I'm wearing a mask, having every third conversation, having to repeat myself, like no matter where I am, I'm talking to somebody and they're like, how are you? And I'm like, mm -hmm. and they're like, what? I'm like, I'm mm -hmm. And they're like, what? I mean, I hate it. I'm tired of you know, like being in a restaurant. Now this happened to me the other night where now I'm afraid to cough in public. You have that one? Like there's this social faux pas where like my wife and I, we were at dinner the other night and I had to cough, but you can't do it. Cause I, I know if I do, like waitresses are going to drop trays. People are going to scream. It's going to be horrible. So I just kind of like hold it in, like muzzle it. So I'm at the table and I'm just like, mm -hmm. like instead of coughing because that's, that's where we live now. That's like the worst thing you can do in society is cough. I, I'm, I'm past this whole thing about, you know, like if, if I, if, if I'm trying to figure out if, if I see somebody that I know because the mask is on, I now look like a sociopath. I'm just staring at them and they, cause they got like this, right. And they, they can't see that I'm smiling, although maybe smiling would make it worse. And I'm just, I'm, I'm tired of the Rona and everything's different this year, man. I mean, everything about Christmas is so different from how we've experienced it. You know, uh, tonight, right now, what should be happening is that my wife and I, we should be going to her annual family Christmas party. This has been going on like, as long as I've been with Kay, so 20 years, uh, actually a little bit more. Wow, I'm getting old. Um, like there's always been this thing where at her, her parents' house, what would happen is like all of her extended family would get together, all of her relatives would come and there'd be a celebration and laughing and, and, and dining and it would be great. And for the first time, it ain't happening. Everybody's separate. Everybody's across the country or in some cases across the, the ocean. I mean, like, it's just a different time of year, man. It's weird. It's weird. I can't stand the separation. And maybe you can't either. Maybe, like, you know, the, you had plans and hopes for this year. And now they, they've gone by the wayside. And they're just people, if we're being honest, that you missed. Now, maybe some you don't, but the chances are really good. There are people that you miss. And you're not going to be with them in person this year. I mean, that hits. Like, you feel that distance. And as we dig into the Word tonight, I want to suggest to you that that feeling of distance is exactly what God has felt going into the Christmas story. In fact, the Christmas story is all about God closing the distance. And so if you have a Bible on you, let me invite you to open up to Matthew chapter 1. That's where we're going to be tonight. Matthew 1, as we read the Christmas story, and it says this, Matthew 1, starting in verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will, she will bear a son, 
and you shall call his name Jesus. By the way, the word Jesus means the Lord saves. So you shall call his name Jesus. And why? Well, because for he will save his people from their sins. And that's the word I want to begin to focus in on tonight. That word, sin. And not in like the religious sense, so don't, don't, don't tense up, right? I mean, like, I, I don't mean how, how a lot of preachers like me would normally use it. Like where you, you say the word sin, and you mean fury, and you mean rules. And have you ever noticed, by the way, that like, man, you get like a good, like a little bit of preaching going on. You talk about sin and stuff like that. Like, it almost kind of sounds like an 80s pro wrestler. Like you'll have stuff just being like, you know, like, and brother, I'm telling you, the wrath is coming. Like, it's something you would expect Hulk Hogan to say. Am I the only one? who thought that okay fine but here's what i mean when I, when I talk about sin i want us to understand like what it is that goes into this whole idea of jesus saving us from our sin now the, the word that we translate as sin uh in, in the greek here is the word amartia and this is a really neat word it's actually a word it's a word picture and so literally what it means is to miss the mark or miss the target Amartya has this sort of connotation, if you can imagine this, of like an archer, you know, and, they, and the archer's there and they take the bow and arrow and they pull the, the string back and they let go and that arrow goes flying towards the target and it misses the target. Like that's, that's what the idea of sin is, is that basically like God has structured creation, he's structured life, God who is the author of life, of your life and mine, he's the author of it and he has, he has said, listen, this is the right way to live it. And when you choose to sin, you depart from that to your own Peril, because here's the interesting thing. I don't know if you ever thought about it like this. Um, the interesting thing is this: that when it comes to shooting for a target, even if you miss, you hit something. Have you ever thought about that? Like, so for instance, like you know, let's let's say you're at you're at uh, an archery place, right? And you go and you shoot at a target. Like, have you ever been uh, like? shooting targets with archery, you know, like normally there's a, there's a, the, you know, the bullseye and then it's on top of like, ba like, you know, like hay barrels, that type of thing, right? Or hay bales. And then, and so if you miss the target, chances are good, you're going to hit the, the hay or maybe you'll hit like the ground or something like that. But that arrow is going somewhere, even if it doesn't hit the target. Same way, maybe you've been to a gun range. Now, if you're outdoors, you've got like the dirt that's mixed with like tires and all kinds of things inside the dirt. If you, if you miss the target or if you're indoors, you've got that big like concrete wall, you know, like, and, but what happens if, if the bullet doesn't hit the target, it still hits something. And the crazy thing about missing the target, like in our lives, listen, we, we've missed the target all the time. Crazy thing is this. The crazy thing is that, listen, okay, sometimes the thing that we hit causes collateral damage. Like, so, so listen, we miss the target in relationships. And what it creates is heartbreak. Or we, we, we miss the target in personal goals and, and morality and how we want to live and who we want to be. Well, well, what happens? That creates like, like hurt and chaos and disappointment and guilt and shame in its wake. And, and, and the weird thing is this, we talk about sin, we talk about missing the target. How many of you know that, listen, even though we, we may try to deal with it in different ways, the crazy thing about sin, the crazy thing about MRT missing the mark is this, that somehow the world is worse for it. Because the truth is all of us, we've got stuff, come on, all of us have stuff that we're ashamed of. All of us have stuff. I'm not talking about little mistakes where we're like, you know, okay, I, I lied when I was seven, moving on. I mean, like, all of us, we have things that come, sometimes, like, it just, we are so, we want to get so far from it. You know, you're, you're driving down the road and a song comes on the radio and it reminds you of that thing that you did. What do you do? You, 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 like, without even realizing, you turn the radio station. Like, like what is that? Or, you know, you, you, you go to sleep or you try to go to sleep and you find yourself laying there and, and all that shame and all those ways you've missed the target just come back to haunt you. Big and small. I'll give you a small one that, that isn't that small. I can remember when I was a kid. Uh, when I was younger, there was, there was a kid who moved on to our block and his name was Adam. And Adam, his background, the whole reason that he, he and his father and I think his three sisters uh, moved there with him. Um, was his parents had just gone through a divorce. And, and I, I didn't know what happened with Adam's mom other than she was alive, but she had no part in the family's life. And I can only you know, imagine that that probably went through some stuff there. And, and so here was Adam, and, and he was moving to a brand new neighborhood, didn't know anybody. And my friends and I, if I'm, if I, if I'm just being honest, um, we didn't take to Adam too kindly. We didn't like him from the outset. And the reason that we didn't is he was very desperate to be accepted. He, he tended to just sort of say and do anything that he thought would make us like him more. And it actually made us like him less. And so there were all kinds of times where Adam was the butt of our jokes, where we were mean to him. And, and we just put him down. I remember this one day. 
This one day, my friends, they, they came up to me and they said, they said to me, hey, Bert, Adam's been talking about you. Like, I, he has? Yeah, he's been saying all kinds of mean things about you. And the crazy thing was this, I knew they weren't telling me the truth. Like I knew, I knew like from all of it, even though I was young, I knew that what they were saying was not true. But see, I wanted them to like me too. I wanted them to think I was strong. I wanted them to think I was tough. So he's saying that about me. Yeah, he's saying that about you. So, oh. so I saw Adam's like playing in his front yard. I marched across the street. I grabbed him by the hair. I threw him down to the ground. I began to wail on him. And this kid just begins to scream as I'm pummeling him. And then in the middle of that, I feel this big hand come down, grab the back of my shirt and lift me off of him. And I look to see Adam's dad, who had this look of just being absolutely horrified. And, and he, he takes me off and scoops up his son and I can still, 30 plus years later, I can still hear this child's voice saying, am I bleeding daddy, am I bleeding? And as he's walking away with his son, Adam's dad turned back and he looked at me and he just said, Bert, I thought you were different. And we all have those moments in our life. We have those moments where, where what we did is bigger than a mistake, where other people that we can see were hurt. And so how do we deal with it, you know? Some of us, what we do is, is we just try and we minimize it, right? We play it down and we go, well, well, okay, like here's why what I did wasn't that big of a deal. And we, and we try to justify it, right? And so, so for, for, for you maybe right now, like, well, like if I were to justify, you'd get me justifying. So we're like, well, you know, like really like Bert, he just, he just wanted his friends to like him. So he just, yeah, but somebody else was hurt. And, 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 and why, why would that make what I was doing okay, right? I mean, like, a lot of us, this is what we want God to do. We want God to just sort of, well, because he loves us, what we want him to do is just be like, oh, it's fine, it doesn't matter. But listen, but that type of mentality of like, let me just justify what I've done, all it basically assumes is that God loves you and nobody else. Like, like if, if I believe that God loves Adam like he loves me, then there should be consequences to my actions there. Um, but what a lot of us do is we downplay because we just think that's easier and, and we don't want to believe that, there are, that, that we're not always the good guy and that sometimes we play the villain in this role of life. And so we just we push it out of mind, push it out of mind, push it out of mind. And others of us, what we do, well, come on, what we do is we carry that guilt and, and it just haunts us. And still others, still others, what we try to do is run from it. We try to run from anything that reminds us of that missing the mark, that MRT. In fact, maybe as you're watching this, this, this broadcast, this is one of the first times you, you've done any kind of church thing in a really long time because to, to think about church or religion or God just reminds you of all these things that you feel like you haven't lived up to. Well, I've got good news for you. See, that's why Jesus came. Jesus didn't come here to condemn you. He didn't come here to just go, yep, you've got amartia, and let me just hold that over you for the rest of your life. No, no. <laughs> Jesus, the Lord says, he came to save you and me from our sin. Jesus came so that we could be made right with God and so that through him, all of it could be wiped away. <laughs> and the crazy thing is this. Even though we... We, we tend to minimize and we tend to remove it. The truth is this, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, sin breaks relationships. It hurts people, it hurts us, and most importantly, it separates us from God. The holy, just God, and we hope that he's just. We hope that he doesn't show partiality. In fact, the book of Isaiah says it like this, Isaiah 59 too, it says, but your iniquities, which means your, it's like the bad stuff you've done, have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. But the news of Christmas is that God couldn't stand the distance. That he looked at you and he looked at me with so much love that he sent his son Jesus into the world to take the penalty for your sins and mine, to die, to suffer the wrath for us so that we could be made right with him to wipe away the guilt, to wipe away the shame, to wipe away the past and give us new life with him. 
And so Matthew continues. In verse 22, he says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And that name Emmanuel, in, in the Hebrew that it originates from, it's Emmanuel. It literally means God with us. That in the person of Jesus, we are reconciled to God. That God is with us. That's why there's a Christmas. That's why he came, to close the distance and bring us home to him for Christmas. You know, earlier we listened to a song uh, by the band Sidewalk Prophets. I'm going to say a big thank you to Dave and the guys for, for uh, doing that. And I love, there's a lyric in the song that says it like this. It says, wherever you are, whatever you did, it's a page in your book, but it isn't the end. Your father will meet you with arms open wide. This is where your heart belongs. Come running like a prodigal. The truth is God isn't looking to condemn you. He's not looking to reject you. He's looking to be restored to you. You know, Christmas is going to be in just a few hours. In the morning, if you've got kids like mine, there'll be little feet tearing down the stairs to rip open paper. Or maybe you're alone and you know, you'll find yourself getting up and it'll be just like any other day. But most of us, when it comes to Christmas time, we have stuff that we want for Christmas. A phone call, a present, uh, a Christmas cookie, something, you know. If you ever ask, I mean, what is it that God wants for Christmas? I mean, like God who could have anything, what is it that He wants this Christmas? Well, believe it or not, I know the answer. You know what it is? He wants you. He wants you. He wants you to come home for Christmas, to be in His arms, to be forgiven of your sin, to be saved, to be reconciled to Him. That's why He sent Jesus. And so, in just a minute, we're going to sing our last song, Silent Night. And it's a weird song because, because, you know, Jesus is born in a manger, if you've heard the story. You know, He's born in a stable, and, and stables are anything, with animals is anything but silent. But let me suggest to you that the silence of the song, this thing about all being calm, all being bright, that has nothing to do with the physical location and everything to do with what happens in your heart as you receive the mercy of God found only in Jesus. So before we sing, I want to just give you an opportunity. If you would say, you know, you're not where you should be with God, but you want to be. I want you to pray with me. And the words that, look, they're not magic. If you've got better words, you can use your own. But let's just take a moment to talk to God and ask Him to bring us home to Him in relationship with Him today. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. God, I confess that I've sinned. I've missed the mark. I've done things that I knew were wrong, and I'm sorry. But I believe that you love me. I believe you sent Jesus to die for my sin and that you raised him from the dead so that I can have new life with you. So, Lord, I'm asking you, please come into my life. Fill me with your spirit. Show me how to follow you. Wipe away my past and give me new life. Be Emmanuel, God with me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you have a Merry Christmas. And I'll tell you what, right where you are, normally this is a point in a Christmas service where we light a candle and sing in the dark. Maybe you've got a candle at home, maybe you don't. If anything, why don't you just grab your cell phone, flip the light on, hold it up as we sing the last song of our time together, Silent Night.
Sleep.